So, um, I, the previous session was, was quite intense, I think. Um, there's quite a lot to learn with templates and, uh, and how to use them correctly. Uh, they are very important, and, uh, but, but don't feel bad if, if they don't make complete sense in the, in the first place. I think the, the sort of concepts around templates are, are quite simple and straightforward, uh, but then once you start using them, it just takes time and, uh, and using them to, to become proficient with them. Uh, later on, uh, Alberto is going to be talking about concepts, which is kind of a, a, a thing that goes together with templates as well. Uh, and in this session in between, we're sort of going to go back to, to kind of trivial, simple things uh, that go really well together with, with, the, with other language features, so like templates and, uh, and things like this. I will also talk about some language features, uh, but in the first part of this presentation, it's going to be actually library utilities. Uh, which, once you start using them, they sort of become second nature uh, and they seem like the most natural thing in the world. Um, but in the beginning, especially when you're dealing with generic programming, they can feel a bit... or it can be kind of difficult to use them correctly in the beginning. Um, so, this is basically this. Standard tuple. Who here has, uh, has used tuples in any language before? Probably most of you. They're they're kind of easy, right? You, you just stick a bunch of things into the tuple, you can index into them, and, uh, and that's it. Um, so why do we really care? Uh, I would say the, the main reason is that uh, in C++, we have, we have some additional concerns, uh, in particular with respect to the type of references, uh, you know, R-value references, L-value references. Uh, and if you don't treat those correctly, then uh, then either you end up with bugs in your program, you can end up with seg faults, or you can just end up accidentally sort of over constraining your program. You can add constraints that you didn't mean to add. Um, and, uh, and that's something that I'll try to show some corner cases where, where you can sort of try to avoid those, those additional constraints where you don't want them. Um, and really, so we'll, as I said, we'll start with the, the sort of library features and then we'll talk about lambdas and other functional utilities. But they all come together at the end uh, into one thing. Let's do a little warm up. Um, what, so this is a template function, which you've now seen in the previous session. Um, what, what requirements are there for T? T is a type. What, what do I require for T for this function to compile? Any guesses? Uh, behind you, John, you don't get to answer, yeah. I, I'm guessing because you put it No, no, not, not you. Shush, John. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, <laughs> means. Wait, let's do this. Can you repeat? You have the double reference. Yeah, which means. Wait, uh, an array or a function? No. No, no. Actually, not. So in this case, the the double re reference is the is the the forwarding reference or universal reference. But you can add on to this. Uh, was it maybe that the type stays the same? Essentially, yes. So I mean, so this is in the end t. T is going to be, let's say, an int, and you call f with an int. You can move into it, or you can pass a reference to an int. Uh, but this is going to accept any type, except void. You can't pass voids around. But literally any type. Uh, the refref just means that, that this is going to bind to all of those things. Doesn't matter what, what the caller of f passes to f, f is going to be happy to take it. No matter what. There's a comment there, gives it away. This, this function does nothing useful because it has no requirements on T. It literally does nothing with it. It doesn't even need to be copyable uh, because, again, these are references. It has zero requirements on, on T. Does that make sense? What if I pass in not a reference? Not a reference. That's okay. You can pass that as well. 
then it's going to be, so if you pass in an L value without moving something or without having a, a literal, for example. So there were the, the expiring values and there were the pure R values, the sort of literals. Uh, but if you just pass in, you know, you have int x and pass in x, this is going to be per perfectly fine as well. It'll take everything. This is generic, but you can do zero with it. That's, that's it. You have no requirements, but obviously this is not a useful function. Uh, what if we do this? What do we require from, from the type t now? Hmm? Indeed, exactly. You must essentially be able to to call it with this operator left shift. Uh, otherwise, this isn't going to compile, right? Many types can be, you know, passed in this, but there's one requirement, and sometimes you might even have this requirement, or sort of accidentally, you have a function that whose primary purpose is something else. Um, but then you stick in a print statement and suddenly your code doesn't compile because not everything is, is something you can print. This, this can be the primary purpose, printing, but if it's not, it's a sort of accidental constraint that you add on top of things. This one follows in the same vein. What do we require of T? <laughs> you have a thought? Maybe? No? You look, yeah? Exactly. Not so complicated. What about here? What what does T need to have for this to compile? Yeah? No. <laughs> well, you know. Someone? So what what do what do these curly braces here do? Maybe that's not maybe that's the difficult part. Even if you don't have the name for it, that's fine. But but the requirement is here that we can uh, default construct this T. Not every type is default constructible. And again, you might not realize this. This is not a, a sort of behavior in the the sense that we usually think of it. But it is a requirement, and it's there in your code. What about this one? Actually, ignore the, the references here. What do we require here? If you think back to the session by Alberto yesterday. It's one of the constructors. You have to have like an assignment? Yeah. Yeah, essentially. You need the copy assignment operator. Yeah. And uh, this one? The answer is actually the same because we accept both references, both L value and R value references. So in the worst, in the most generic case, you might just have a plain reference there and forward will keep that reference and then you need the, the copy assignment operator again. Okay, this is just to, to sort of give you an idea of, of the, the kind of constraints that we don't necessarily think about normally, uh, but they are there. And, um, and especially when you start, start writing your custom types and, um, and maybe you default the copy constructors and the move constructors, they might not actually always appear as they are. They might actually get deleted even if you type default. Um, so your types end up having certain properties in terms of, you know, what you can do with them, not just having member function foo, but also in terms of what you can do with these things. It can also be, can I compare these two things? It, it feels like the most natural thing to do, but not every type has that. So every time you write a function, you're adding some constraints, except if you write the stupid empty function that doesn't do anything useful. Okay, um, so this is gonna come, so, so keep an eye out for these things and uh, because this is important, this is when you're storing things, you're storing your types in, inside other classes, uh, you have to take care of, of 
dealing with these types correctly. Because otherwise you'll end up copying things when you don't, didn't mean to copy. Uh, you'll end up maybe moving things when you didn't mean to, to move them. Or you'll have a dangling reference somewhere. Um, so the first utility, following with the theme that we're going to look at is tuple. Uh, it's a class template, uh, which we've seen before. Uh, you can pass template arguments to this. In uh, C++, so this is a, a compile time thing, not surprisingly, uh, it takes a number of template parameters. And basically, it's going to store one of each of those types. And the types can be different, or they can be the same. What I would say, don't use tuple if if all you're storing is the same type. Most likely you want to use an array or something like this, because an array also has a, a fixed compile time known size. Uh, and most likely you want to be using this instead of sticking them in a tuple. You can index into a tuple just as you can into an array, but this conveys your intent much better. So I would say don't use tuple for that. Another thing is, um, you'll often want to return sort of very simple data structures. It can be like in this, in this case, an interval. There's a begin and an end. Simple enough concept. I would say don't make this into a tuple. And uh, why is that? Can anyone think of a downside? What, what's the problem with, with defining interval as just a tuple here? It's not a compilation error. Yeah? It's better to read it if it's the same class. Absolutely, absolutely. You're giving much more information by, by explicitly stating what, it, what is the name of the first member here, and what is the name of the second member here. Um, if you really want to have this behavior as well, it's actually possible to do that also with custom type like, types like this. The keyword to look for is structured bindings. But that's a, a sort of extra topic that, that we're not going to go into. Uh, but most of the cases, if, if you're doing stuff like this, don't use tuple for that as well. Now, so what is it good for? Well, generic programming, that's one of the main topics we're, we're talking about here. So basically, if you know the types already, don't do it for that. If you have generic types, but you have a fixed number of things, eh, maybe you can use a tuple. I'm sort of indifferent about that. But if you have a, a pack of, of types and you have no idea how, how many those are, what types they are, that's a perfect use case for a tuple. Um, so that's, in my opinion, or in my work, basically tuple comes up most often in these kind of situations. Uh, basically, it's just storage for some, some types that I don't know beforehand what they are. Um, one of the, one of the common use cases, at least in HPC, is uh, where you want to you want to actually describe your work first, uh, but then you want, might want to exec execute it on different execution contexts. So you're sort of separating the the the, the storage of what arguments to call, uh, what function to call. You're doing that at one point, and then at a later point, you're actually doing that action. But to be able to do that, you have to be able to store those, those arguments somewhere. That's, that's a common use case where, where standard tuple comes, comes in really handy. And I'll show you an example in the next slide. Ideally, we would be able to do just this here. We said, like, pack expansion, you can do it in many places. One of the places you cannot do it is, is like this. If we had this, we wouldn't really need tuples, and it'd be quite nice. And there are actually proposals for doing this in C++, but we'll have to wait a bit for that. So until we have that, we can have a type and a member which uh, stores a tuple of TS. That's a perfectly fine use case for tuple. Um, so here's, here's the, the sort of GPU launcher, kernel launcher example. Uh, just to put this into context. So the idea is that I said that we can sort of first describe the work. Uh, in this case, the important thing is that we're calling a function fill. It's a, it's a CUDA global you know, 
function. Uh, and it takes some arguments and then there are some launch parameters, which if you're not familiar with CUDA, it just sort of describes how to, how to distribute the work. Uh, now the point is that at this point when we're constructing this kernel launcher, we're not actually executing this function. We're just saying, this, do this later. And then for example, uh, sometime later, we can collect these somewhere. And then when we actually have a stream to execute this on, we, we pass this stream into this kernel launcher. I think that's a reasonable thing. Here's an example of, of how to do it besides the to-do. One of the exercises is to, to fill in this, this function here. Uh, but in this case, again, we have a little helper function for constructing it. You can mostly ignore that. The important thing is here that we have now the arguments here, the array and the, the size and the x that we want to fill, fill the array with, they end up as, as arguments here stored in, in T. We have to put them somewhere, right? So we put them in a tuple. Um, who here has seen decay before? Or knows what decaying does? Yeah? Yeah, among other things. That's, a, that's the most useful thing. It also turns uh, function types to function pointers, and it turns array types to just pointers as well. Uh, basically, we need it here to be able to store it, because we can't store function types, for example, but we can store function pointers. Um, but, but this is the important thing. That's, that's what tuple is, in my opinion, for. Everything else is, is uh, one-off things. I didn't say, if you're doing sort of uh, exploratory work, you just want to return some things, you're, you're testing things out, out, by all means, do return a standard tuple for a while. But before you push that and commit that to the master branch, make it into a struct. Uh, it's both for yourself and for uh, future yourself as well, because you'll, you'll know what you're dealing with if you give those things names. Um, now, I, I don't know, maybe you guys can think of other ways as well. I counted at least five somewhat distinct ways of constructing tuples, uh, which is maybe a bit sad, but it's good to know about them. Um, so I've got a table here where um, I've listed the, the types of the parameter pack. So with a concrete example. So in this case, we've got an int and we've got a reference to double and then some custom type. Um, and then we're constructing a T. We don't say what type it's going to be, but we just call, call one of these here to, to construct the tuple. The question is, what, what is the result of this? So you've seen from John's presentation, decal type just, just tells me what, what is the type of T. Um, so the first line is, uh, is probably what you're going to be using most often. This is, this is actually using this class template argument deduction, because uh, we're not explicitly specifying what the arguments, what the template arguments are. So what's the result of this? Um, turns out that this actually will construct a tuple where all the references have been removed. Okay, there was only one in this case, but it's going to remove references. Because it's kind of a natural thing to do. Um, at least to avoid mistakes. Um, if, <laughs> if you want a reference, you have to be explicit about it. And if you're not explicit about it, then most likely you wanted to make a copy here. So basically, even if these were forwarding references or something like this, you would end up copying them into the tuple because that's a safe thing to do. Because then you're completely detached from wherever these TS came from. OK. Uh, there's another, there's a function actually. So before class template argument deduction existed, there were these helper functions and they still exist. They're not going anywhere. But there's a function called make tuple, which kind of works like the class template argument deduction. Uh, and in this case, it actually produces exactly the same thing. Uh, it's going to remove the reference and, uh, and copy things into the tuple. Not too much to it. There is a little minor 
difference here that if you have a thing called a reference wrapper, which I'll show later, make tuple is going to remove that and uh, tuple is not going to remove that, uh, which is why I would suggest you, you just use the first one if you have a choice. So right, this is C++ 17, I think, right? Class template argument deduction, yeah. So this you can use from 17 onwards, uh, and most of the time there's no reason to use make tuple anymore. It was necessary before, but no longer. Now, we can also specify the template arguments explicitly. And uh, from the previous slide, we have this decay thing. So decay is going to remove the reference. And the int and the my type, they don't have references, so they stay as they are. And again, we get the same result. This is perfect for storage, and we're again detached from, from, the, from the inputs here. Now, if we specify these things explicitly, but we don't decay them, um, then we end up with these, these three types here explicitly. We get exactly the same thing, and I've got the ampersand in the wrong place. In this case, we, we're saying that we care about this being a reference, but at the same time, you're taking responsibility for, for this tuple here outliving whatever this double reference is going to be. This is important. Maybe at this point it's a bit abstract, but this is, it's a distinction that you would make case by, by case. If you know that, that this tuple is going to be used immediately, you might be able to store a reference there. If you know it's going to go somewhere else, it's going to go in a different thread, or something like this, yeah. yeah. I, I think the bottom line is that if you store a reference to something somewhere, the reference is just a pointer. Anything. It's yeah. a pointer that you don't have to do star on it, right? But it's basically a pointer, which means that if the object that you're pointing to is going away, that reference going, is going to break your code Yeah. later on. So when you store a reference somewhere, you need to be, you need to take care of, be sure that everything is, is, is all right. Absolutely. And uh, the same applies for the last one. Uh, but this is a special function where you say forward as tuple. You saw the forwarding, forward, standard forward. Uh, this will basically do the same thing if, uh, actually this is wrong. I need to update this one. So this would actually be ref, 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 because uh, we're passing these all as L values. So they would all be stored as references here. Um, again, same, same problems apply. You have to be careful about this. But this is sort of, if you're temporarily putting things into a tuple, then this is useful. OK, uh, let's do a slight variation of this, just to come back to this thing about constructability, move constructors, and, and things like this. If we're actually forwarding things now into the tuple, what, what changes here? So the, the main thing that changes is that we get exactly the same types, at least in the four first ones, uh, because we're, you know, they have the behavior where they decay types and they don't care about references. But the difference is that, for example, if my type is, is expensive to construct, it's, it's going to be moved into the tuple. So you save that. Um, and you don't require, in this case, for example, a copy constructor on the, on my type. Um, so in this case, the forward as tuple, in this case, it's correct. Here it should be int ref ref and my type int ref ref, uh, my type ref ref, because these are basically well, just plain values, and they get added. So if you do a, you know, a ref ref on on something that doesn't have a ref at all, then this becomes a ref ref, and this one just stays as a ref. Okay. Any questions about tuple? We'll see a few more use cases later. Makes sense? No. Okay. Uh, optional is a little tiny utility that sometimes comes in handy. Um, you might have seen it from other languages. It's sometimes called maybe or uh, something similar like this. It's basically a type that holds a type or nothing at all. It's a bit like an, uh, a pointer, which can be a null pointer or not, but the safe version of it. Uh, so a sort of trivial example is, for example, if you're doing division, um, if you're just doing plain division, this is uh, undefined behavior, at least for integers, I think. Um, if, if y is 
zero, you have problems. Uh, whereas a sort of safer version of this would be to, for example, check if, if your divisor is zero, and then you can return an, a so-called null opt. Basically, this will construct an empty optional because there's no way you can do this operation correctly or safely at least. Um, so you return an optional in, in well, an, an empty optional in the case that, that your divisor is zero and otherwise you do the, the division as normal. But you're making it explicit in the type system that this operation may in fact return a, a value that doesn't exist. That's the benefit. You're not hiding the fact that that this operation may fail. Um, I've got a caveat at the bottom. I think in many cases, either throwing an exception or uh, using standard ex expected, which we will see later as well, is probably a better choice though. The downside of optional is that you have no information about why the value is missing, which may sometimes be important. So use this with caution. Um, here's another example. Um, we have a vector and we say pop back uh, on a vector that we just constructed and it's empty. What happens? This is undefined behavior and it's not, it's not really said anywhere in the interface that this operation can be wrong. So as another example of what you can do, you can have, if you have a container which where you can get values, but sometimes there might not be any value there. One option would be to, to return an optional instead. Because again, you're explicitly declaring in your in interface that there's not always something there. And this is useful for both the caller of the, of the function, but then also for the, for the API designer or for the library designer, they know that, oh yeah, there's no way the, the user can mess this up. Um, coming back to, to more generic programming um, topics, one of the, the requirements we said, we, there were different constructors, right? Now sometimes you might want to have a type where, um, where you're going to fill in a value later on. Maybe you, you compute it asynchronously. You know you need, you, you're going to have that value, but it's not there yet. So one thing you can do is, is you have your container and you put your T there. But this is again generic programming. What's the requirement of T? Well, we require that it's default constructible if we do this. And by doing that, we're restricting the types that can be used with my container here. Um, so basically we cannot construct the my container. We cannot default construct it. We can provide if we have a value right away, that's perfectly fine. But this is another case where we can use optional because we're saying sort of in the beginning, there's nothing. Uh, and this will happily, happily compile even if we don't have the, the T at hand at this point, even if it's not default constructible. Because even if T is not default constructible, an optional of a T is default constructible. Um, so we're kind of hiding, well, yeah, we're kind of saying that, you know, it's okay for this to be empty, but now we're also saying that we can accept any types to put into this optional. Does that make sense? Okay, we'll come to the last, um, last sort of utility and that's variant. Um, variant is in my opinion, something that doesn't actually come up very often but there are some, some specific use cases where it can be useful. Um, it's good to know about it. Uh, don't worry if you don't have a use case for it. Don't, don't stick it everywhere. Uh, like tuple is the important one. Optional is sometimes useful and variant is a bit less frequently useful. Uh, but just so you know what it is, um, basically it, it looks a bit like a tuple. So you give it a number of types at compile time but only one of those types is active at a time. So it can store one out of many types. Uh, who here has used union? 
No. So Union exists in C and C++ as well. It, it's basically the same, but a language version of a uh, library version of it and a sort of more safe version of it. Uh, where you're saying, you know, I, I might want to have one of these X things, but only one at a time. Um, so up here we're saying, I, I want to store an int or a string. So if you have an uncountable set of things, you might want to accept anything. This is not the thing to use. The benefit is that by specifying up front what types I expect, uh, I don't have to do any sort of uh, any heap allocation or have virtual functions. Basically, I know up front the, these are the things I can have and, uh, and I can do that without overhead. Again, coming back to sort of no or low overhead programming in C++. Um, so if we construct a variant like this, this is basically going to construct the variant with the string alternative active. Um, like with tuple, you can uh, access things either with, well, with standard get. This exists for tuple as well, and you can index into it. So basically, you know, the zero is the int and the one is the standard string. So this is OK. Um, we can also explicitly ask which type to get from there. So we can say, I want the standard string from there, and this is OK. Uh, if you try to get a type that's not active at the time, you get an exception. It's going to throw this bad variant access. Uh, you can also ask, does the variant hold an alternative? It just returns true or false. Um, the, the useful thing comes in the end with this uh, standard visit function, which basically lets you operate on what's inside the, the variant without knowing upfront which variant is active. You want to operate on whichever one is active. So this is going to take a, a visitor that needs to have overloads for each of the types that you have in the variant. Example. Um, this is a little ASD example. I don't look too much at it. You can look at this uh, you know, slowly. It's in the exercises. Uh, as was already seen by one person, if you're on a Mac, this doesn't compile on Apple Clang. I'm sorry about that. I'm going to push a, uh, push a comment to disable it, but you can also access it through the Godbolt link. Um, the important thing is here, we have, uh, so this is a sort of abstract syntax tree. It's a little mini example where we have a finite set of things, basically the nodes in this abstract syntax tree, which in this, it's like a little mini calculator where you can have addition, multiplication, or you can have just a number. So I have those three are my, my variants. I can have basically one of, one of each, and then I can traverse down the tree. Look at it in your own time. The important part is here. The way we evaluate this abstract, abstract syntax tree is uh, we have here the, the AST is a variant of a literal, of an addition, or a multiplication. And then that can go recursively. And then we visit this thing with a visitor. And this visitor here is a struct, which uh, has call operators. Just like there are comparison operators, or you, know, you can have conversion operators, you can have a call operator, which is you know, just the operator brackets, but then you have the actual arguments here. So this makes this struct behave as if it were a function. Uh, but this means that I can pass this visitor into visit here, and then depending on what's in A, I'm going to call one of these things and then recursively go down and evaluate the rest of the tree. OK? Um, there's one, one extra little thing with, uh, with variant, which is that there's a special type called monostate, uh, which is actually not really tied to variant, but it's kind of meant to be used with variant. It's really just an empty type. It's a struct, but it doesn't do anything. It doesn't have any members. Uh, you can copy and, and move it as, as you wish, doesn't matter. And the purpose of this is really just to give this variant uh, the potential to have this empty state. Because you can put it as the first, first template parameter here. And then if you default construct this variant, it's going to construct the monostate. 
it's a way to, to kind of have an optional in a variant without having an optional with a variant inside. I, I, I don't know. Do you know? Uh, it, this is really computer scientists going mad. Uh, monostate is good because everything that you are care about is something that can change, right? You have a Boolean, which is the minimum thing is it has two states. So monostate, it means is basically it's nothing. There is zero information. Well, and there's the information yeah, theory yeah. thing that, yeah, probably a computer scientist like me are really excited about, but <laughs> <laughs> the other people don't care. So just as a little exercise, if you wanted to implement optional uh, using variant, what would you do, roughly speaking? Any ideas? Use the monostates, indeed. So a very rough sketch, there are no constructors and so on here, but basically, you know, a variant with a monostate is the first thing, and then you put the T here. This roughly behaves like a, an optional. You have to make sure the rest actually matches the semantics of optional, but you know, we can emulate that if we wanted to. Okay, that's the, the end of the, the sort of utilities session. Uh, do you have any questions at this point about these? No? Okay, so let's go to some of the more functional utilities. Has anyone here used, I don't know, Haskell? <laughs> yeah, standard ML? Yeah, there was one? No, okay. Haskell, yeah, exactly. Uh, Scala, Clojure? No? Okay, so some of these things are inspired by sort of functional programming um, languages. Um, you can implement these in C++. C++ doesn't constrain you to use one particular programming paradigm, uh, but these are just as useful in C++ as they are in other languages. Maybe they're a bit ergonomic in other languages, but they exist here as well. Um, and again, these kind of often come into play when you're dealing with generic code, when you're sort of wanting to to sort of rearrange your arguments, you're wanting to pass them on to some other function and, uh, and manipulate at this generic stage. So let's start off with lambdas. You've already seen, seen lambdas before, but, but let's start with an example. Uh, so probably the most common use case is, is, uh, for lambdas is when you have higher order functions. So you have functions that take other functions. Which is great, because you, you get to abstract away not just the data, but also the behavior. Um, so in the standard library, there is, for example, a function called transform, which takes every element in, in a container and, uh, and transforms it according to some function. And that function needs to take, take one of each element and then return a new element. So what we can do is we can have a plain function. This is perfectly fine. We can, uh, we can pass in this function into transform, and this is going to compile. Um, but, so this requires that we have this, this function out of line here, and maybe it has some custom behavior, or maybe it's some very specific behavior. Maybe we only need this function for this particular call. And then it's kind of annoying to have to define this function in the name, you know, in namespace scope outside of a class or something like this. Um, and that's where lambdas become really, really handy. So function, uh, lambdas, I would call them a, a, as basically function literals. So as you have, you know, the number three is an int literal. A lambda is a function literal. Uh, it lets you write in line a function um, and pass it into, for example, transform. There's not so much to it. The, the main distinguishing syntax that identifies a lambda are the square, brace, uh, square brackets. That's the important thing. We'll see in the next slides what you actually can do with them. But even if you don't do anything with them, they have to be there. And then after that comes a parameter list, just as with a plain function, and then the function body. 
not so much to it. Uh, the nice thing is we can also assign this to a variable. So we can give it a name, but we can do it now locally within this function. We can also put it in namespace scope. And some people might actually advocate for making all your functions lambdas, but I wouldn't maybe go that far. But you could do that. Um, so this is, this is quite nice. So in this example, obviously, I had my, my triple here. I assume this is somewhere out of line, and maybe this is inside the function. And now you can specify much closer to where you're using this function what behavior you want. That's one of the main, main benefits of using lambdas. Second use case. What if you want to add state to this function? So there's another function called partition, which again takes a container um, and a predicate. So something that takes in one of the elements in the container and then returns a boolean, yes or no. And then it's going to split that uh, container into two parts, basically. Or it's going to reshuffle the elements so that elements matching the, the predicate are in one part and not matching the element are in the other part. So we can again go with the function. And let's say we want to split it into even and odd. This is kind of straightforward. We can still use our regular functions. Uh, and we can still use lambdas. So nothing has really changed. But what if we wanted to implement a sort, for example? And we're partitioning this into something based on a pivot element. So we want to split things into larger and larger than some element and less than some element. I just have a question. Yeah. Um, so the last call, so what does it return? Where, where does the partition go? This one, I, uh, I think it's going to return an, well, OK, this is the ranges version. I think it's going to return either an iterator or a range to the second half, because you already know where the container begins. Oh, so it, it's like it just? I think it's going to return to the second. Exactly. It's going to be the same container still. Yeah. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So it's in place, indeed. Someone can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but now, we've got this pivot here. We do it based on, on the vector here. It should be an x. Um, but this is not going to compile. Because our pivot here is, is defined outside of this function. Um, so it's going to complain. Uh, and the trick is that this list of square brackets here, this is a so-called capture list, which can be empty, and those are still useful. But you can also fill it with things that you want to capture. And this is where lambdas turn into something called closures, because they kind of close over the environment around them. Um, I think closures are not really used much in C++, the term still usually called lambdas. But if you hear that term, it's the same thing. But then you're typically referring to this fact of capturing things from, from the outer environment. Um, and now, if we capture this pivot here, now we're free to use it in here. So we've added state to this kind of function-looking thing. OK, and we can generalize this. Um, I've got one more example, and then I'll show you a bit more the syntactical sort of details of, of lambdas. Um, let's say we want to, so std async is, is a thing which uh, will asynchronously call a function with some arguments. Don't, if you haven't seen it before, doesn't matter too much. You can just imagine it, it calls all prints with v. That's the important thing. Um, if we've got a number of overloads here with, uh, with prints, and we tried to pass, well, let's say, say we tried to take the address of print into all prints, and we pass this in here. This is not going to compile. Because we don't know which of these overloads. If I take the address of a function, I, it needs to be a specific function. I can't actually take the address of a set of functions, because that's not just one thing. Um, what I can do is, for example, if I want to specifically take the address of this uh, templated function, um, which takes, let's say, a vector of an int, because that's what we're passing in here, I can do this. 
one print, and I could pass this in here, and this would compile. Uh, but if I change what I pass in here, then I have to change this one as well. And it's not generic. So what can we do? Well, we can use lambdas again. Uh, this is a kind of pattern that is sometimes called lifting a, a sort of, well, an overload set into a function. Um, but we can take our lambda, no captures, we don't care about those at this point. Uh, this is a, a generic lambda, so it takes any argument by value in this case, and then it calls the print function. Now, since our all print is this uh, lambda object thing, which we don't know yet really what it is, but we know that it behaves like a function, we can pass this into, into all print. The secret here is that we're delaying, well, not really delaying, we're moving the decision of which print function to call into an actual function call. On the previous slide here, we're not actually calling the function, so we don't know which one to take. In this case, we actually have the argument here, so we know which function to call, and the lambda itself will accept anything. So we can pass this thing into, into async. Can, can I have a comment here? Yeah. Because in the last two lines you see auto, and you have a lambda, and then you have auto, and you have async, right? Auto is a way to say, I don't know what the type is, I don't care, give me whatever. In the, when I put auto, and I put a the lambda there, you have to put auto. There's no way, you don't know what the type will be, because what the compiler does, it takes that function, it creates actually a function object, somewhere and then it will it will give the name of that type which is and it, which is something that only the compiler knows and you can actually inspect that type if you use some things right you can even see the type but you don't know what the type is so you have to write auto it, auto in the asyncs i think is because the type is super complicated you you don't want to actually because i think the type of the async you can actually write it down. Instead of writing auto, you could spell it out in principle. Here. Yeah, this yeah. this would be a future, actually. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But but then but then you can yeah. write the Indeed. type explicitly. You don't have to write auto. Yeah. Yeah. You write auto because it's easier. But in the other case you have to write auto. It's like can you, I think it's the only case in which you have to write auto mm. uh, in C. But I'm 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 not so sure. Yeah, probably. Yeah, I mean yeah, exactly. So the type of the lambda is the important thing. And here, I could put in a standard vector of int here, but then again, we're not generic. Then we're again just hard coding the choice. So, so this we have to do for genericity, and this we have to do because we literally don't know the type. Right? Um, okay, let's slightly step back and look at, yeah, sorry. Yeah, go on. They're, I mean, they're both the same in the sense that I, I don't care what type this is, they're just take anything. Sense, yeah. The second one in the lambda also has some additional semantics in that it, it makes that lambda. Yeah, so, so how, how I read it, how, uh, my mental model is that the second auto is because you are not allowed to use the template uh, keyword there. Because the it is basically the same thing. Yeah. yeah. In lambdas, for lambdas you, you can, can write template. No, there's there's going to oh, be a slide can. on that. Okay. Yeah. That, in twenty. In twenty. In You're behind the times. Yeah, but okay. I missed that one. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? No. Um, so yeah, the, uh, CPP reference. If you want to know exactly what you can put in a lambda, this is the sort of specification for what you can do there. I'm not going to go through all of this. As I said before, the important thing is that you have the, the square brackets uh, and the rest is uh, either optional or, uh, well, not entirely optional. You still need the body and you need sometimes a parameter list. Actually, the square brackets and the body are the only, only things you always need. Um, but let's look at a, a sort of mental model for, for how the Lambda actually works. So. 
you saw in the previous examples, you can have in a, a class or a struct, you can have an operator, a call operator, operator parentheses. And uh, the way to think about lambdas is really that it's a, it's a, some class type that you don't know what the type is, but it has this call operator here. So if we've got a, we've got a real lambda here, which captures an X and it takes an int and it returns something, we can emulate this by having this lambda type here, which has an X member. This is the capture. And it has a call operator, which has the same function parameters. Uh, and it has the same body. That's, that's kind of how you can think of these things, except for the caveat that we cannot name this type. I mean, we can look at what the type is, but it's implementation defined essentially, and we cannot name it in code. Okay. Uh, you might even have, I think this is probably how it's, it would work in the, in the compiler. You might actually have exactly the same sort of lambda definition, but you'd have auto real lambda one, auto real lambda two, and they will most likely have different types, I think. Um, so that's, that's the basic mental model. Um, now, I only showed before you could capture by value. If you put the x, x just as it is, then you capture by value and you make a copy into the lambda. If you put an ampersand here before the capture, you capture by reference. And then, you know, the corresponding change in the, in the my lambda model is that the member is an int ref. Okay? Everything else stays the same. Um, then there are default captures or a default sort of capture mode, you might think of it. Uh, so you can put a reference like this just on its own as a comma as the first argument. It's not a concrete argument or a capture, but this is just the default, which means that everything that is not explicitly specified here ends up as a reference. So here in the Lambda, we're using X. Um, and it's not explicitly specified in the list, then it ends up as a reference. Make sense? And you can do the converse. If you want the default to be by value, you put in equals. Um, and then everything else you can explicitly capture by reference. In this case, again, the X is by reference, the Z is by value. Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> one thing that can be a bit dangerous, uh, you can actually capture the this pointer of a class. So if you have a lambda inside a member function, um, you can do this, literally. This, no pun intended. Um, and you can capture this into the, into the lambda. Now, What's the type of this? Does someone know? Sorry? Exactly. With the important part being it's a pointer to a class, which is, as we learned previously, it's essentially a reference. You're not copying the thing. You're still pointing to the original thing. So if I were to do something dumb like this, I spawn a standard thread, which goes off and executes at some later point, and then I detach it, uh, and then my class goes out of scope. If I use this here, once my class has gone out of scope, I'm in trouble. Uh, this can be safe in some situations. Again, if you ensure that the lifetimes match. But by default, probably you want to be capturing actually a copy of the class. Or you don't want to detach here, actually. That's, that's the bigger lesson here, don't detach threads. Uh, but if you have to do it, then probably you want to be capturing this thing. It's essentially as if you're dereferencing the, the this pointer and making a copy into the capture list. Yeah. Um, what's this one? Ah, right, initializer list. So before we, we've just had sort of one name here that we can capture. Uh, you can actually initialize 
these things here. It doesn't have to be the same name. I can actually come up with a new name here. So T2, T1 is, is from the sort of outer scope. There's no T2 in the outer scope, but I can give it a new name. So I can move T1 into a new member of this, this lambda here, uh, and that's perfectly fine. And in this case, I'm explicitly moving it because I know that I can move it. So I'm avoiding a copy. Um, I can also call this the same if I wanted to. That's fine. Um, and then I can call some function here. Now here's a fun one. Um, we've got the same example as, uh, as on the previous slide, except that, uh, so I captured this T2 here and I moved it here uh, and then I want to move it again into G. <clears throat> because this, this function is only going to be called once, so I don't care. I, I can move it. It's not going to be used again. And then we've got two overloads of G, one which takes a ref ref and one which takes a const reference. Which of these overloads is going to be called? Any guesses? So who thinks the first one? One, two, eh, eh, three, maybe. Who thinks the second one? No one for the second one? It's the second one. John. <laughs> um, what's the reason for this? Uh, the reason for this is that, um, well, if you, looked, if you looked closely on the previous slides, you might have noticed it. Um, the reason is that the call operator for this lambda is const by default. And this, if you guessed the, the, the ref rep version, that is perfectly understandable because this goes kind of opposite of all the other default conventions in C++. But maybe they woke up at some point and were like, yeah, maybe we can try to change the defaults. So in, in this case, uh, well, yeah, the, the call operator is const, which means that we cannot actually move this thing. So we get, so move will give us a const ref ref. But you can't ca pass a const ref ref into this because there's no const, but you can pass a const ref ref to a const ref. Logical, uh, not. So the, the thing we had before is that there was this const on the call operator here, but you can change that by adding a mutable after the parameter list here. And then basically it's going to remove the const here. And in that case, we can move our x here. This is a thing to be, be careful about because this will actually, this will happily compile and move, as we said before, move does not, it, it's really just a hint and sometimes it's not even a hint because it cannot be moved even, but this will compile. Uh, this is, I, I think in my, my view, quite a big, big foot gun, uh, for performance at least, but also for correctness sometimes, um, uh, that this actually compiles. Uh, and in some cases, it might actually be a good idea to have like a custom move, which will fail to compile here. Um, but uh, I can show you that at a later point if you want. A um, few more things. So we had the auto parameter before. As we said, this is a generic lambda. It will accept any arguments. The mental model for this is again, the call operator. Uh, this is the wrong way around. Parentheses should be here, but this can also be templated. It's essentially as if all the, all the auto parameters, they get their own template parameter. They're independent. Um, we can also add qualifiers here. So this is, this is the same as here with the ref ref. This is a forwarding reference. So it can be an R value or an L value reference. Um, and then you can have nothing. This is always by value. Um, finally, for Mauro, since C++20, you can actually have an explicit template parameter list as well. Not in 17 yet, but since 20, you can do that. Um, I haven't personally found a, an explicit use case for it yet, but I think this becomes useful when you start talking about concepts, because then you can constrain this type 
uh, here in the template parameter list. But you'll learn more about that later. Uh, this is just for you to know that this syntax actually exists as well. Um, I'm going to skip this one, actually, because it's kind of complicated. You, you can capture packs of, of, uh, of types as well. And since C++20, you can do it more conveniently. But I'm going to skip the details of this. Um, what do we have? So far, let's go back to, to this guy. So far, we've always had auto here, yet another auto. We can have auto as a return type. And then it's deduced from, from the body of the function or from the return statement. Um, often this is, this is good enough. If you want to explicitly specify it, however, you can do it with this sort of trailing arrow and type syntax. There's nothing too special about it. You can actually use this syntax also on plain functions, uh, which is kind of interesting because it means that you can refer to types, uh, yeah, to types in here, um, in the expression here, if you have more complicated things. But most of the time, uh, for lambdas, this is perfectly fine. And for regular functions, most of the time, you're fine with keeping the return type in, in the regular spot. Let's stop there for a moment. Um, that's lambdas for now. Does, so who here feels like, or who here had heard about or used lambdas before this? Quite a few of you. Uh, who here realized you have a bug in your code with lambdas after this slide? Maybe not. Maybe you don't want to admit. So, uh, so maybe you haven't since, realized. So since a lot of people use lambdas here, what was, did you find this explanation something that, did you learn something from this explanation <laughs> or not? <laughs> yeah. Because to me, I mean, it, it feels very useful because when you start just using a feature without knowing what is behind, I feel always a little bit un unsafe, you know. So, ah, I don't know if this works or not. If I know what is behind, then I can, okay, then I can really adventure into it, right, and try things out. So I, yep. this is why I think this is quite cool. Yeah. So what are we doing with time? Yeah. Um, we're coming towards the end, and then I think we can continue with concepts before lunch still. Um, standard function is uh, it's kind of a handy utility that you can use sometimes. Uh, it's a, so formally speaking, it's a type erased callable wrapper, um, where type erased means that the only thing we care about is what the function type is, but we don't care actually what sort of function went into it. We can put any kind of function into it as long as it can be called in a specific way. Um, so one example is that you know we, we can template our functions, uh, but sometimes performance is not not the highest priority. So we might have sort of a, a sort of startup routine in our library. Maybe we need to. We want to add a handler that can sort of customize the behavior we do the startup. And this is a thing that's called only once. And if there's a bit of overhead from, from type erasure or something else, it doesn't matter too much. You most likely don't want to use standard function in like a hot loop uh, in your computations. But if you don't care too much about performance in a particular situation, then you can use standard function. The traditional way would be to have the have actually a function pointer. This was the syntax again. This is a pointer to a function returning void and taking some const reference to a configuration. Uh, and then we have a this is our user supplies function that we pass into this register startup handler. Because this has the, the correct type. Okay, this is one thing we could do. Um, we could also pass a lambda in, in this thing here if we have a function pointer, assuming that this lambda doesn't capture anything. They can be converted to function pointer if they don't capture anything. So, yeah, they're not always function pointers. In some certain situations, they can be. 
And especially, yeah, okay, so this is already said, if you capture something, then this is not going to compile anymore. Uh, we could template this thing, and this is going to this is going to take this uh, print config thing, and this is going to compile just fine. But the downside is that now you have to have the definition of this, this function in a public header file. You get different instantiations for, for different functions that you pass into it. And in the worst case, if you have a lot of them, you can end up bloating your executable or library for no sort of tangible gain in this particular case. You don't care about performance in this case. So why make it more generic than it needs to? So what you can do is instead take a standard function of a function type. And now we can pass our, we can pass our templated lambda. We could pass a free function. We could press a struct with a call operator. It doesn't matter as long as it has as long as it can be called with a configuration like this. So it's quite nifty for this. Uh, so the downside is, as I said, it's type erased, uh, which means that there's heap allocation. This adds some overhead. Uh, there are virtual functions, typically, which again adds some overhead. It's not a lot, but it can be enough. As I said, if you're doing this in a hot loop, it might be too much. But if it's a one-off thing, this might be a much better option than uh, templating your, your function. Um, and importantly, yeah, you can, uh, you can hide the implementation in the source file. So a little summary of this. We've got uh, on the left there, we've got uh, the type of function parameter. So we can take a function pointer, or we can have a templated function, or we can take a standard function. Uh, and if we give these functions one of these things, either a plain function, a stateless lambda, stateful lambda, or a standard function, then it will or will not compile depending on what you pass in there. So plain functions, you can give that to anything. Stateless lambdas, you can give that to anything. Stateful lambdas, you can't pass as function pointers. And uh, standard functions, if you want to pull your hair out, then you can click this link and see why you might not want to pass state, the standard function to function pointers, but otherwise it's okay. We're getting close to the end. Uh, bind front, this is where the, the sort of Haskell inspiration comes in. Bind front uh, does what's called partial function application. Um, this is also C20. Um, basically, it will, it will sort of take some function parameters and store them for later use. You remember our kernel wrapper thing, kernel launcher thing? You could use bind front for uh, implementing at least part of that functionality. Actually, yeah, depends where the, the stream argument goes. Um, but basically, this is a very similar, similar purpose, where um, I can take, if I have a function f, which takes a double and a string, um, and I say bind front with f, but no arguments, then basically the result of this thing is essentially the same f. So I can, I can call this with x and y and int and a string. I can also bind just one argument here, and then what remains is a callable which only takes the remaining, the, the string argument. And I can bind all or both arguments as well, and then the callable that remains is, is something that has zero arguments. Any questions about this? Um, this one will actually copy arguments into, into the bind front wrapper thing, um, which is why we have a slide later on what you can do about that. Um, apply is another one, which comes up in the exercises. If you want to implement the, the kernel launcher thing, you'll need standard apply. What apply does is, it, again, it takes a function, but instead of a list of arguments, it takes a tuple, or something that looks like a tuple. Something that can be indexed, and you can get the arguments out of this thing. Uh, so it's kind of like the, you know, you can do sort of the asterisk in Python to expand a list of arguments. I, I'm not a Python expert, so I might be wrong about this. 
Uh, but it has a similar purpose. Basically, if you have again f with an int and a string, but you have a tuple of 42 and hello, if I do standard apply, it's going to call f with those two arguments. Again, this comes into this, this uh, idea where you store arguments, but then you need to unpack them somehow at a later point. And then this is where apply is super useful. Uh, you can mix this with bind front as well. Uh, they work together, but, but there's nothing special about this. If you have some things in a tuple and some things you have bound you know, ahead of time, something that are out, outside of the tuple, then you can do it like this. But let's skip this. One exercise is to finish this thing. It was the kernel launcher. Um, one exercise is to implement apply yourself. Um, there are some hints in the in the exercise file. Um, if you have any questions or if you need sort of more hints about this, you'll need some some utilities from the previous session as well um, to be able to do that. Um, okay. This is another exercise. Does someone know what the bug is here? Can you guess? This is a generic function. We want to apply G to the arguments in TS. And is this going to work for all TS? <coughs> Did you see it? <laughs> yeah? Um, Ignore references for now. That it's a good point. Yes, I left them out because it complicates things, but uh, it may not work for references. It's in the exercises, and and you can have a look at that. Um, what did I want to say here? Uh, ba -ba -ba. All right, no, my type. Eh, let's skip that. Good. Um, I said bind front copies the argument. If you really want to have a reference, again, this is like you opt in to a potential world of pain if you do it wrong, but at least you make it explicit that you're dealing with references. There's a thing called standard ref and uh, standard reference wrapper. Reference wrapper is the type and ref is a helper function that helps you construct a reference wrapper. So you don't have to type this long thing. Basically what this does is takes this x here and creates a thing that looks like a reference, but it can be passed around like a value type. So you can copy it, you can move it, which, yeah, you can move it, then you move the thing from inside there. It's kind of like a pointer without using a pointer. And uh, it cannot be null either, like a pointer can be. So this is, again, you can opt in to have a reference. And this is, I think, a, a sane, one of the same design decisions where you're saying, OK, I, I know what I'm doing here. I want to use a reference. Um, but yeah, this is, this is where you would use ref in that case. There's a CREF version as well, which is the const version of, of ref. Um, I think I'll stop here, actually. Or where's Alberto? He's outside. Oh, he's, okay. Let's not stop. <laughs> Has someone written something like this to initialize arguments? Do you, do you know what this one does here? The, this is sort of ternary question mark colon operator. Who here hasn't? Do you, who, no, have you all seen it? Yeah, okay. So this is an expression. Basically, it takes a Boolean, and uh, if it's true, it returns the first one, and if it's full, it returns the second one. Kind of nice. Um, it's a nice compact syntax, and it's an expression, importantly. So the, the result of this expression is always y or z. Um, <clears throat> if I try to do it like this, if I have something more complicated in, in here, I want to have some complex expressions, I can't do this. Because if it's a statement and it doesn't return anything or it, it doesn't evaluate to a type. It's like, there's nothing I can do here to, I, I can't return Y or Z, uh, I can't break, I, I can't do anything there. This is not going to compile. Um, if I wanted to do this, I could do this. I could again default construct T 
which again adds constraints. Um, and then fill it in later. But again, you're doing this sort of two-step thing where uh, you're first constructing it, then you're moving something extra into it, which probably doesn't add much overhead and might be compiled away, but it might also not be. Um, and it, most importantly, I think it looks kind of ugly and it's not very readable. So this is a thing used with caution, but we can use lambdas for this. Um, we can initialize x with the result of a lambda call. So we said we could we could define this is like an inline function literal. Starts here, we capture everything by reference now because what we do at the end here is just call the function. We're not going to use it later. We're not storing the lambda. We're just calling it immediately. That's where it comes from. Immediately invoked function or lambda expression. Uh, what we gain by doing this is that we can have our whatever complex initialization here with an if else, which doesn't do anything. But now we can stick return statements here. And they're going to be returned and initialize x here, which is kind of nifty. This can get ugly, and uh, as I said, use it with caution and can kind of look ugly if you're not familiar with it, but it can be very handy as well. Uh, one of the things you can do is make, make x const now. In this example, you have to leave x not const because otherwise you cannot assign to it later on. That's one thing. Another thing is that, uh, as mentioned before, that uh, in some cases you have guaranteed copy illusion from a function like this. So if you're constructing a whatever type of x is going to be here, it may be that this actually gets just put straight in here, that there's no move or copy construction going on, which is another bonus. Okay. Um, yeah. I've never used that hack, but it's lovely, so I will start using it. Question, does the compiler guarantee to inline that? Um, I don't think it guarantees that. That's probably up to the compiler. I, suppose it depends the, on I, I don't think the standard would have anything to say about... I mean, in general, the standard doesn't have anything to say about inlining. But it, it, there's no way of saying force inline on this, is there, on a, on a lambda in this case? I don't know. Okay, I'm nope. curious, thanks. Yeah. Um, I've I've used this lambda hack, as you call it, uh, sometimes when I initialize class members in the constructor initializer clause. Mm -hmm. Would you say that's a good uh, design decision? I, I think that's a, probably a fine thing to do. In that case, you might also just want to name that function, like initialize member x. Uh, because it's a bit clearer, especially if you have a long list of, of things you're initializing, it might be clearer. Same thing in this case. I mean, you could just name this as well. But the, the, the thing you lose is, of course, that uh, then you'd have to pass things by, by parameter here instead of having them in the capture list. So I'm not sure. Depends on the case, probably. Yeah. Any other questions? No. Um, just for later, you can think about how that works. It's kind of nasty, but kind of beautiful that you can do this in C++. Um, I think it's also in one of the exercises. Here's another one. Think about if you can find a use case for it, uh, but I'm not going to talk about them. Um, so I think we can stop at this point. Um, I don't think we're going to start the next session now. So it's essentially lunchtime. Um, do we have anything to add? A couple of slides back. Yeah. Maybe more than a couple. How far? Lambda hack uh, or before uh, that? But yeah, maybe. Oh, yeah, there. Which? This. Ref. Yeah. So I think it's, it's interesting, and people should know more about this STD yeah. ref and STD C ref. It, if you want to be scared, you look at the source code of ref and cref. They are surprisingly difficult. 
surprisingly complex. Yeah, it's just really crazy. Uh, but it's really something that is important, as uh, as Mika was saying. Is like it makes you understand what you're doing. You know, now I know I'm passing reference here. I know I'm doing something that I should not be doing, but I know. <laughs> yeah, and um, it's good that uh, that you start thinking about that kind of stuff. Be you know, be aware of what you are doing when, when you write the code. Yeah. Because C++ can be hard <laughs> at some point. Yeah. 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 Okay, why, my question is, why do they supply a uh, standard riff if it's yeah, somehow dangerous? I mean, there must be a reason why you really want to convert to a riff, but it's still dangerous. Why? Uh. <laughs> I mean, one you take it. One answer <laughs> is why do we have references in the first place? Uh, I mean, if references are so dangerous that we can't use them, then we shouldn't have them at all. Uh, but they are clearly useful. Uh, I think if you have references in the language, then you can have a wrapper like this. The nice thing about this, as I said, this makes it explicit. This is something you can grab in your code base and be like, where do we use ref or C ref? And then you can be more careful about that. You can have your you know, pull request review and be like, oh, ref here. I, I'd better check a bit more carefully. Um, if you just have a plain function call, you don't actually see if th something is being passed by a reference. <coughs> Which, I mean, is one of the benefits, but also can be dangerous. I mean, another, I don't know, does it work? Yeah. yeah. So another issue is that why do we have references at all in C++? And the reason is that if you have a large object and the only option you have is to copy it, then efficiency goes down the drain. So you need the references. But they are not something you want to use all the time. And so this is why you want to be explicit. Yeah. But, but uh, as a more specific answer to your question of why provide a function like that, is in one of the earlier slides, Mikhail showed how, for example, when you put things into a tuple, they often get copied by value. Mm. So you end up with a tuple. And if you have a function which calls a function which calls a function, and you start with a reference, what you'll find is that at some point down the chain of function calls, that reference has actually been lost and it's become just a value. And sometimes you want to make sure that reference is preserved through the call of functions. And so if you put standard ref in at the point when you first invoke the first function, that standard ref is a different thing from the from the from just the value and so it gets passed through the function and it stays yeah. as a standard ref to an x all the way through and then effectively at the end yeah. it's then still a reference and to, you know until the point when it's actually used when the reference pops out if you like so it's it's a way of you having more control yeah. is that you know, yeah that's really that's the point the, the kind so, of idea. exactly so in, i mean in this example if you decay a standard reference wrapper it's going to stay a standard reference wrapper yeah. it's not going to turn into a plain reference or even be copied. Yeah. Uh, one thing about using standard reference wrapper is that it has a conversion operator to a plain reference. So if you have a standard ref of something and you pass it into a function that takes just a reference, uh, that conversion will happen automatically for you in most situations. If, if you have template functions, you might not be able to deduce the, the conversion. That's the corner case, but uh, in many cases, it will be automatically deduced. So you don't have to change all your functions to take reference wrappers and references. That would be unsustainable. Yeah. Uh, could you list some uh, use case that uh, you usually do with uh, Lambda uh, rather than uh, defining another function? Because what I find is that uh, since Lambda is only used one time and, uh, and, uh, I really don't, ca cannot find the situation that only Lambda is suitable. Yeah. So that, 
So I feel like you, you sort of answered your own question, but let me expand on that. If you have a function that is called only one time, it's a sort of one-off thing, it's custom made for this particular use case. That's the perfect place to use a lambda because you can put that definition then in the function or member function where you're using it and it will not pollute other namespaces. You can have a name that is local to that function. You don't have to come up with something that is unique across the whole code base or in the namespace that you're in. But it's sort of tailor-made for that particular use case. Uh, and I think that's why, sort of, in a roundabout way, you answered your own question. That is the use case. If, if you have a one-off thing, that's, that's perfect for it. Uh, because you don't have to, to lift it out. It's close to the use, use, uh, use site. Um, kind of in, in the same way as you would probably rather have a local standard vector rather than have a, I don't know, a, a global standard vector which you're filling, which there are other problems with that, of course, but, uh, with global objects. But basically, you want to, to, to limit the scope where something is visible. Um, and I, for me, at least, that's one of the best reasons to use lambdas. Do you have something to add? You use lambdas a lot as well. And yeah, um, I can add that you don't have to be scared about the cost because, as, <coughs> as Mauro said yesterday, uh, a lot of things get in line and it happens also with lambda. So it's just a nice thing to have in the code if you need it and you should care much about performance because probably the code will be in line anyway, so it doesn't have a cost. Yeah. And one use case, I use a lot Lambda in place called Lambda. I don't know how you called it. Immediately um, invoked. Yeah, yeah, immediately invoked. Uh, I use them when I want to initialize something const, but it requires some logic. And so I close the logic there. I initialize it. I return it. And I think it's a very nice yeah, use case. Indeed. Oh. Yeah, that, that's a very use, that's a very nice uh, to do the const in initialization, and and I also would advise everyone to use const uh, yeah. whenever you can because const not only helps the compiler do the best job, it also helps people read the code, and and also. Uh, yeah, to know what is supposed to happen with that thing. And also if you make a uh, mistakes and by mistake, you change a variable that you're not supposed to, the compiler would tell you. So use const whenever you can. Oh, 